Is your mic working? I don't need a mic. Can you hear? Say something. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, we, uh, it's really just kind of amazing, I'm nervous now. <laughs> we, I'm not so much, um, in, I lived in New York for five years. I refused to meet Philip Johnson because as was the custom of my generation and my intellectual ilk, I believed him to be the incarnation of evil in architecture for five years. And <laughs> I think that was a little bit. A little bit of introduction, huh? And, uh, anyway, the big instructor of the show happened. Um, and as a courtesy, I called him for lunch, you know, to thank him. I thought, this is going to be really easy. I'll go in, I'll blow him away with a few little uh, intellectual observations about um, Nietzsche. I won't talk about he'll, he'll give me the courtesy of not talking about architecture because he doesn't know anything about it, and I know about it. It'll be very easy to take care of. So I get there, and I start talking about Nietzsche, and I go about two minutes, and then he shuts me up and goes about an hour. You know, and I thought, well, this isn't going to work. <laughs> So then we start talking about architecture, and uh, it, it was it was an eye-opening experience. And from the, from that point in time, I realized I had made a really serious mistake. That uh, I had left one of the men that was a great man, and it was a friendship that I was going to try to cultivate. Um, and what we started to do occasionally when we were asked to appear in public, or we were asked to appear in public. What we thought we would do was try to just have the same kinds of conversations in public that we have when we go to his office or go to lunch. So we, you know, sometimes the conversations are interesting, sometimes they're not. But we, we, we thought, this is what we do. We'll sit in front of people and we'll try to talk about architecture. So I ask him a question, he may be interested in it or not. I'll show some slides and stuff he doesn't know what's coming up, and we'll see what happens. So this is what we're going to do now. It's completely unprepared. Um, I don't really know what the slides are or what the topics are. And the other thing that's important, I think, uh, is it's not just about Philip and I talking to one another, it's also about you talking to me, or if you're interested talking to Philip, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> <but> <laughs> I'll do the talking, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to ju jump in at any time. I'm going to start with a question, um, and then we'll see how it goes. You did this project in Berlin, um, which we don't, we don't have I to say. I don't have my slides, sorry, I don't have my slides. <laughs> And it's a, imagine a slide of a you know, typical Berlin fabric building. And then you gave a lecture in Berlin. And at that lecture, you showed the project you would have done if it wasn't for the restrictive design codes of Berlin. So it was a kind of attack on the idea of what was going on in Berlin. So I, I want, tell me, or tell us what you were, what the differences in the two buildings were, and why it is you would have preferred to do the latter to the former. Are these people really interested in anything like that? I was just getting started, you know. <laughs> Here they are. Berlin is now a city that's being entirely rebuilt, as you know. And they don't know what they're doing. They don't have any good architects. And uh, it's very sad indeed. So I come along, you know, the wild man from the west, so I'll bring, I'll bring knowledge and everything. And of course, I fall flat on my foot. I designed a building. They liked it. They were building it. But I don't like it. Because the rules are so strange there. Everything has to be 22 meters high. Well, so what is that? What you want? And you can't go back from the lot line. Right? You can't go out over the lot line. Right? You can't have the animals. Uh, you can't have glass, you can't have stone, I mean, not all. So it's a very, sort of a junkyard of uh, different crafts, and I think it's very nice, but nobody else does, so that, that's all right. But it's so silly to rebuild a city with a pile of rubble. Well, we're building, check my child, if you ever been to Berlin, there's nothing but a pile of uh, a rubble. Well, why do you have to then pile the street line, for instance? The previous jobs that were there, oh, I was the safe street, but it's about this wide. Uh, and then in the middle of it is a subway station. So single-handed traffic goes back and forth, and we're building a modern city on that street. 
and the modern city has to go something like the Wilhelmine uh, city of 1914. Well, of course you can. And who wants your own house in this pretty well state? I guess you've never seen. So there I am stuck. Of course, I'd rather have fun back then and then. Of course, we could. This is my house. But you have fun seeing what you can do uh, with these ridiculous uh, uh, restrictions. Then I got four angry with Peter Eisenstein. said, why don't you make one take the time off and make one that you like to do? So I did. It's uh, very amusing. I showed it in Berlin. And uh, anybody that's not about it, I don't know what they were thinking of. But it's uh, quite ugly. Uh, it's a series of, of, of mountain shapes. Man Mammalar, I mean, you see? Say it again. That's right. Mammalar. Mammalar, mammalar. Breast like. Mammalar. 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 I would come to the source of all knowledge. Do you think we can do something about the sound? Yes, please. What would you like to do about the sound? <laughs> How are we doing, all right? Yeah. Good. Can they not hear? They can hear you. No, it was a bug. Oh, I know, but he fixed that. Yes, he did. He got these bright technicians. Uh, now, what happened? Uh, I can't sit down. I'm stuck now. <laughs> Uh, I can't sit down because you can't see me back there, and that's not fair. And, and I can't see you, because if you're looking across, then I'll stop, uh, stop talking. But uh, what I'm showing now in Berlin is what I like to do and what I'm doing, nothing else but now. And that is uh, recalling another uh, thing from the past. You know, I'm always looking into the past is why he thinks uh, I'm a terrible architect, uh, because I pick things up wherever I can. So does everybody. Uh, so do you, by the way. Uh, you're taught that you're not. You're being original, but you're not. And uh, neither am I. Only I like it, you see. Uh, Charles Jenks and I enjoy uh, picking up things and, and using them in a different way. And uh, Charles Jenks is, a, is one of my heroes because he does exactly what he wants. And uh, have you all, have they seen his house? No, no, but I, everybody's invited to lunch next week. And <laughs> <laughs> never mind, never mind. But uh, let's see the photo. Yeah. So what I like in uh, in architecture now is uh, a man named Finsterlin, which if you don't know, I'm sure it's in the library. Yes, we have one. They sound blank. They know Finsterlin. No, we know Finsterlin. You do know Finsterlin. They're not blank because they don't know Finsterlin. They're blank because you like him. <laughs> you see why I enjoy getting on a platform with him? He's just too much for me. Uh, isn't that funny? I thought you liked Finn Stewart. That was last year. <laughs> well, I'm going to let him talk. This is good. No, no. This is good. But of course, that's what's fun with him. If you're not doing so well, you just look to him and he'll pick up everything up. Uh, do any of you remember my last speech in this room? It, of course not. It was in the 50s, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> hey. I thought you looked all different. Uh, but you weren't as nice in those days. They were <coughs> viciously against what I was saying. It was that I was an eclectic. And that uh, I used that word for the first time, admitting that I really did uh, like very strange things that made him think I didn't know anything about architecture. But uh, I've always liked history. I think history, I think you cannot not know history, as I've hundred times said. And uh, I think the better you know history, the better you'll know uh, what, the, or what the world is all about today. And one of the great movements that I missed completely when it happened was expressionism. I sat there disliking Mendelssohn's, uh, uh, what's that, Tower, I think, Einstein, Einstein, thank you, the Einstein Tower, how could they do anything so silly? Because Mies had explained to me how, uh, how awful it was because it wasn't real, it wasn't real poured concrete, it's all made of bricks. And then the, the, the stucco just oozed around it, you see. Well, that was, of course, a sin against Mises' Holy Ghost, where a brick is a brick is a brick, and concrete is concrete. Uh, but that was when modern architecture was in its uh, full glory. This was 29, 30. 
But you see, that was already 10 years after his own work was expression. <coughs> Mises' greatest work uh, is not what we know. Mises' greatest work are those enormous 20, 30 foot drawings that he did in 19, 20, 21, 22. That was the great period of, of, of uh, expressionism. You all know the, the pointed one on the opposite thing. Uh, but also the, the roundish one. They're all, they're all very, very exciting. When he was expressing himself any way he wanted. Well, I'd say, why don't we also have fun? We're having a miserable time now because we don't know what we are doing. Are we decon? What the hell is that? Are we, uh, are we modern? He likes modern architecture now. But this year, he likes Dennis Lesden. <laughs> Nobody thinks that's funny. That's funny. I think it's funny. <laughs> I think it's terribly funny. But uh, I'm going around. It's quite near here, you say. Yeah, we're going to go. It stops raining. Can we? We're going. All right, we're going. Do you all agree with this great man? Yeah. Who, you? Yeah, I do. Yeah. It's the best. It's the oh, it's the best thing. I didn't know it is. I didn't say it was. That's fair, yeah. He did other things. Yeah, that's the best thing. I was the best thing. Is that all the International South could do for London? I'm trying to think. <laughs> <laughs> he did the National Theater. National Theater. Yeah, National Theater. Which they're going to ruin. Which the sorry, which the Prince is in charge of ruining. Ruining. Um, fixing, I think they call it. Fixing. Um, we're going to look at some slides and some stuff around London in a minute. So. The nicest part of England is that you have the brightest people in this town. You have come to the right place, and they're all as bright as he is. Not quite. Uh, we send him over just so you really know what a bright person is. <laughs> but uh, you've always been a, an astute observer of talent. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to be funny. But uh, what's so wonderful in England is the uh, amazing dichotomy right now, and how it's changed over the, the few years I've been watching it uh, between what's represented now by the Prince and. Uh, and the English, I find very English thing, the uh, high tech, we call it in the States. What do they call it here? High tech. Yeah? Uh, but we think that's very English because that's where England came in in the 19th century. England was uh, 50 years ahead of the rest of the world. And uh, and, and they are again, in, in their terms. And uh, <laughs> I think they're all just being as whimsical as I am. I think all this joinery and the, the tension, you know, the tension's a little thin line, and then the compression is a bigger line, and then you join in with something that goes around like this. Uh, it's all very beautiful. I, I love it. I go into Lloyd's and enjoy every minute of it. Uh, although I want to go to the west one, the Stansted. I've got to get there because that is really fine. Unfortunately ruined by the, the users. It's too bad that users get in the way. That's the next thing to learn in architecture. Don't listen to the users. Because they're not interested in the same thing you and I are. They're not interested in, uh, in, uh, in, in beauty. Uh, can you use that word these days? I guess not. You're not interested in glory then. <laughs> I spoke last week in Vienna about the glory period of, of, of um, Comrade Stalin, and uh, people were very perplexed because they thought he was a terrible man. I guess he was. And no, nothing that tells me the contrary. But his work, I mean, there's a man that went to work on architecture, and boy, he spent hours and days away from the affairs of state on architecture and on beauty architecture, nothing. They were built it beautifully. Why do we care about uh, building houses for the workers? That's a lot of German talk. Uh, let's build, um, let's build uh, the great things for the future of Russia. Let's build, just even, even the little subway stations, let's make them palaces. If you're gonna make some uh, subways, let's make a palace. Nobody since then has made a palace out of a filling station. <laughs> Well, same thing, a subway station. Uh, well, why shouldn't we? What's more, use, what's more unpleasant than, I know not in London, but try New York sometime. And, uh, and, and you won't hardly live to tell the tale, but uh, these endless passages with no glory, no sense of, of monumentalism, no sense of, of uh, history, no sense of, uh, I think that Jenks would agree, wouldn't he? 
But those are very, very great buildings. And it's too bad that you have to be a... No, you don't have to be a dictator to do that. But uh, you, you cannot judge uh, good architecture by morals. That's an old English trouble. You see, you have people like Ruskin, and people like Morris, and you have people like Mutasius, but he was a German, but same problem. Uh, <laughs> or people like Karl Marx, he was English. Uh, <laughs> well, he lives in the, in the... Didn't he live in the library here? Sure. Uh, but it's all that moral business about how to do good architecture. You have to be true to the client or to the user, or to the um, Mises, for instance, to hang up with being true to the material. Why do you have to be true to the material? I remember in the 1920s, in... Uh, There's a hole in the floor. A hole in the floor. <laughs> then you'll be a real user. You'll, you're, you're, <laughs> you'd be worrying about the architect to put a hole in the floor. I can't come in here, because then I can't see these people. Uh, Where were you? Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> No, that was quite an important point. Oh, well, the how was it? Oh, yeah. Mies believed that you have to be true to the materials, like the brick. He was a fetishist about bricks. He dimensioned his buildings <coughs> uh, by brick sizes, of course, but not any brick size. The brick size he was using. So he never made the, the dimensions of his houses. He laid the bricks out on the ground, two, two rows of them. And uh, then you know how big the... Uh, the house is. Well, that, that, that's running it pretty far, right? And now, of course, once again, we're back at the old days, we never pay any attention to bricks at all. Uh, London would be ashamed of it, though, in the 19th and 18th centuries in this town. There's no greater brickwork in the world than, than any little side corner of this great city. Because the brickwork really was almost the best under uh, the Edwardian period. Well, those strange, ugly buildings, but Boy, look at that brickwork going around a bay window. <laughs> and look at the queen closers there. Uh, another wonderful story in England only of uh, people that laughed an, a, a mason off the scaffolding because he didn't put the queen closer in right. But he wouldn't know whether the queen closer was right or wrong or whether that corner needed a queen closer. What is a queen closer? <laughs> Let's look at the price. Sometimes the ignorance astounds me. Okay. <laughs> this is stuff I do in a slide. Complete damage. You can start them from the front. <laughs> okay. Is that the first slide? Yeah. What is it? Oh, Rem. Rem's house. Rem's house. Thoughts on Rem's house? Yeah, but do we have to keep the light on so they can't see it? Well, it's coming down. Oh, there it comes. He claims it's a discussion of your glass house. Does he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it basically says, here's your glass house, closed corners, and it just keeps the swimming pool up on top. Oh, very intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> you were there? I was there, but I didn't recognize the references. To your own help? <laughs> no, I didn't. Well, he didn't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> something he tells you. Well, he's a very strange architect. He may be the greatest architect living right now, but he's strange. And uh, he... If when you go to see this house, which you have to do, by the way, it's the most important single architectural monument uh, of new days, but you have to go and get rid of all your prejudices and all your senses of what's pretty and what isn't pretty, all your senses of references, because all you see is a, a lovely facade of me even here, the, the front. Uh, oh, this I mean, it's a, it's a conspicuously modern, at least in its, or, its form, it's not about formal interest. It's not about strange angles or wavy. You know, it's a decidedly modern arrangement of the form. It seems like you would not be interested in that. I'm not interested in that. But what I like about that house is that I don't understand it. If you see something that you enjoy enormously, but that you have any idea why, if you go to the Parthenon, you're going to enjoy it. But you know exactly why. 
because uh, those particular Greeks knew exactly how far apart to put the metopes. They knew exactly how far the antithesis should go. Uh, and you can follow all, exactly and build it all over again and you won't be any good anyhow. In other words, if there's a mystery there that you find in, in all great architecture. And this man has created something that absolutely fascinates you. Now, you can't see it, I don't think, because I can't, but then I'm stuck. Uh, for instance, that red color, he picked it because in the next neighbor lot, there was some red earth, which doesn't look at all like a house. I think he's crazy. Then, uh, then what is that ribbon window? Is that Kovacir? It doesn't do the same thing Kovacir does, but he doesn't care. Uh, it's Villain <laughs> Savoir sitting on the fast house. house. It's, mo it's an irony of, it's a kind of postmodernism using modernism as its ironic quotation. No? That's very good. Go on. Tell me more, because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. I want you to, there's a competition that you saw recently. I want you to judge one topic against the winner. This is a, this is Aki's winning competition in North. Thoughts on this? Yeah. Go ahead. What are they? Well, you said I had to look at another one. Yeah. Then there's another. There's this one. Wait. Very interesting project. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder who that was. <laughs> this is a uh, Baron Chardel entry, and uh, it looked to me. I mean, the. the the effort to at least produce a kind of formal interest or spatial interest is much more aggressive than... <laughs> That's the problem of having the architect in the audience. So, I mean, if you were to, if you were to evaluate these two projects, do you have any thoughts on them or not? I don't think I can judge from here any more than you can. Uh, much the most attractive is, is of course, Baram, uh, because you make lovely spaces where where people stand and feel exalted by that thing. Whereas in the slides you show, anyhow, Esau doesn't have anything like that. So how do I, how do I know? I mean, the idea of taking somebody's project and, and asking what's good about that's the best shot, the one on the right, because uh, that gives you the most monumental marvelous feeling of that uh, of that solution. Well, then there's an in, in the Berlin Project and then you knew for if you really are looking at, um, at uh, bending and folding the forms in such a way that they're not angles, but neither are they modern forms. And for some reason, I was wondering what it was that was attracting you about convoluted and involuted and fisterlin type formal language as opposed to either the deconstructivist language or modern or postmodern language. What, why is it you think you're finding this work more interesting? This one. Yeah. Or these kinds of... This kind of approach. Well, in the first place, it's, it's the hell with Euclid, and it's a new way of, of getting spaces together to make excitement, but somehow Baram and you uh, have a sense of order here, uh, which is uh, very, very clear. Isazaki's too ardent. You know exactly what to expect. And you know it's all too, too there. Do you suppose it's because we lack excitement in our modern period and, and this gives us a, a woozy a feeling of excitement? Well, hey, don't you think it's a dangerous path for architecture to go down to? No. In every case, no. all it tries to do is produce another thrill? No. I think that's what architecture is all about. If we can't get a thrill out of out of concert halls we make today, or uh, Gothic cathedrals, we have to invent a new way of getting excitement. And to me, this is it. Uh, I can't do that. Uh, we're on way ahead of me. But uh, I'm having fun. I don't even know. All right, Ron, that's done. And, and I'd like to have you see it and see if it's going to look like that. Too bad you didn't win. But uh, I want to see what you see. Did very well in that model. Uh, much better than the, I'm doing a, a wiggly house in it. I, I think you could try to make it look like that. You think you know what that looks like? Yeah. That's yeah. great. God we, we actually, we didn't design the perspective. We just came out of the computer. So we were surprised that it looked like that as well. 
because it is that wonderful sense of, of all good modern architecture, which is a sense of unease. You notice it in Baram's thing, too. You feel there's something wrong here, but isn't that great? Okay. I don't know why that's so important, or the, the sense of safe danger that other people have written about that uh, I find that I use all the time. For instance, I make a bridge, I don't put any railings on it. I made a stairway, but so steep, uh, and no handrails, that uh, very few people get to the top. Uh, I can get there because I know where the little places are, but uh, I get a kick out of it, so does Trince. So do we all. But we don't talk about it because it's sort of a negative thing, isn't it? But uh, if you think of it a minute, isn't it more fun to come on a, a, one of those wavy bridges in Peru, the hanging bridges, you know, and it is a perfectly safe engineered bridge? Of course. It gives you a very uneasy sense as it sways this way and this way at the same time. Uh, so it just gives you that feeling. But it, it <laughs> do those columns really hold up that thing? About 20 times too many to do it in the first place. In the second place, they tip it an alarming uh, way from each other. So that doesn't give you a, a, the usual nice uh, sense of a, of a column, you know, how he treats as if it were God. Uh, she just throws them in. Well, you're in feature, though. Each little building is an effort to be a kind of exciting little object in its own right without any particular connection to anything else. It's a kind of trivial idea, isn't it, of the possibility of organization. It's just one interesting episode after another competing for what techniques to create interest they use. No. Don't you think that's a kind of de uh, deficient idea of like the city is a collection of little bitty objects. Yeah, but the city. Whoever gets a chance to build a city. If I build a city, it would all be, be peculiar, but city planning is a mother's game. Nobody does any city planning now except the prince. Uh, and he can't pay for it. Uh, it, takes, it would take too much. But uh, the city business is all over. No, what's great is taking little personal things like Barams and this and, and my little uh, octopus and uh, and plopping him around. Uh, who's this? Oh, this is our friend. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Right next to us. I know. Uh, right down the road from the. Well, uh -huh. He's not funny enough. <laughs> not interesting. <laughs> no, I don't find it dull. Next. <laughs> This is Frank Gehrig. Uh, and all these things are within 100 meters, 100 meters or so from each other. 100 feet. Uh, is that a problem for you to just stick all these things down in the open field? Oh, no. <coughs> I, I'm trying to do uh, to, uh, what's his name? To Lewis. I'm plopping them down. I, I, I did, if, if he says I want a tower, of course, then I made it very high. But uh, to beat him. But, uh, Frank, of course. Frank Gary is very jealous of Zaha Hadid. But Hadid came along and, and, uh, and won up this design. But that's all good for you, Tom. Nick, I want, we really want to see what happens when you do this in London. <laughs> oh. You know this? Oh, yeah. And? I don't think I'd like to talk about that. Okay, Nick. I pass it every time I go to the show, you know that? Next uh, four rounds. Uh, Isn't that four? Uh, must be going back. So there one more. Yeah, with us. Uh, Oops. <laughs> you know this is? No. Terry Farrell. No. Who? Quinn and Terry. Quinn and Terry. Brand new. By the way, the latest thing. <laughs> There's two ideas about plopping stuff down in London. That's what makes London such a great place. I mean, aren't you in some way responsible for this? Who is? Do you think, I mean, aren't you a little bit responsible for this kind of architecture on the left? Oh, great. Did I actually uh, come out for postmodern architecture once? <laughs> Do you think the Lloyd Village did this? Oh, wonderful. A very serious attempt by a very good architect to uh, elaborate the 
parameter of modern architecture. Uh, uh, on the one hand, this is extensively attentive to the status of the content. On the other hand, the, another, the other building absolutely denies the content. Yeah. But as he says, uh, isn't it nice once in a while to have a denial? Well, I'm sort of interested in this once in a while because it means that basically practices of once in a while monumental architecture are parasitic. They re actually require a whole system of background practices against which to stand out and produce monuments. But isn't there plenty of background practice lying around? Folks, what the, that's the trouble with this. It looks like background architecture. Let's go. Next. It isn't quite enough, you see. I just agree it's in this one. Now, there's the background architecture. It happens to be one of the in. It happens to be one of the greatest uh, outdoor spaces you could have. But the architecture just repeats the same day, what, 80 times over. I don't have time to count it. But it's very satisfying. This is less so. Because Quinn and Terry isn't as gifted as the... Uh, uh, there is no... This one, one more. That is one more. Rather sequel. Uh-oh. What do you think of that? <laughs> So now I suppose I'm responsible for Charlie Cook. <laughs> Isn't this plopping down something complete as an effort to be interesting in the middle of the city? Isn't this basically the same strategy as Lloyd? Isn't it sometimes true that uh, bad architecture is just bad architecture? <laughs> Small, you have to squeeze the, uh, the square footage, and of course, you can't if you're working for a developer. Let's look next. Let's see what comes up. Next. What? Now there's, some, uh, there's somebody that got away with something. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do both of these? <laughs> 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 You're a car. Uh, <laughs> what is the one on the left? It's in the... The one on the left? Both sides? No, that's the graves at Humana. Well, that's Humana. What were you thinking when you did that? I wanted to... I was a good boy, I thought. And I wanted to connect uh, the what you saw, uh, not just the ribbon windows that you see behind that building, but I wanted to turn it to... Uh, something that looked uh, like the University Club and like him even White in general because they were great architects and I was sure that I could do it well I couldn't but uh, you, did this, you did this building you made a cover of Time Magazine yeah I didn't know I was going to do that but, but now you do your wavy buildings or you do your efforts to look at a, a much more abstract and uh, uh, complex no language. it's as simple as this you're going to make the cover? But I can't, no, it won't make any cover. What I don't like about this isn't the shape. I think that's delicious. And I especially like the humor in, in the top, which everybody can laugh at. Uh, people like to laugh at buildings. My later building down the street from here is called a uh, lipstick building. Well, I didn't call it that, but it's that so we're stuck. But uh, the, the restaurant on the ground floor is called the Lipstick Cafe. But it's shaped, you remember, like a, a lipstick and a star thread. But this building, I found out what was wrong with, with postmodernism. We don't understand it. It's not in our blood. And, and it, I'm sorry, it's not in Trinitarian's blood either. Because if you look at those, uh, uh, at those spikes, those uh, obelisks, they don't sit on that roof uh, the way a Palladian uh, column that obelisk does. Just compare them. Uh, in other words, it's not so easy 
to look at a great building. Imagine the people that have copied the Parthenon again and again and again. And yet you go to, to Athens, there's no other way to understand the Parthenon, and you just faint from joy. But doesn't that mean if you got it right, if you learned how to do it, that all of a sudden that's not it is going to be better? No, I don't think it will. I think that you can't do it. And I think you can do things that are more in line uh, with what you're working on. This is next. I don't know. It's, it's, it's Maybe it's all over. That is. Why? Yes. Any questions from the audience? Well, they're not there. Uh, shouldn't be asked questions yet. You haven't come to a, a great crisis of <laughs> speech making yet. No, no, no. I'm, I'm uh, choreographing the time in my. That's very fast. Oh, there'll be questions from the audience. I hope so. Are there questions? Or at least objections. Lights, huh? Mm -hmm. To wait a minute. I was interested in what said about Greece being a slave to the materials, the bricks and laying light. I mean, that's exactly what happens in the Georgian Spurgeon. I know, that's what makes him so good. I know. Sorry, I thought you were saying that you got me, because when the Georgians did those long things like uh, uh, the hospital or Gray's Inn, uh, they become so satisfied. You try doing that as an architect, you fall on your face just as we do in every academic uh, campus in America. We say, oh, we'll do it uh, strict, strictly Georgian. That'll be satisfying because everybody knows the rules, you know the thickness of the mountains, you know the, the, the spacing of the windows, you know the height of the window, you can go and measure it. Why can't we do it? It's a mystery to me too, I'm not being funny. It really is hard to do. Now, the reason I find it so sympathetic to do uh, uh, well, whatever it is we're doing, I don't know, uh, expression is, is because uh, I feel more at home with it than I, than I ever did uh, with the postmodern work. Because I realized that try, and I could make an exact uh, idea of a, of a cushion and woman as cushion column. Well, it looked funny. I have absolutely no idea why you can't do that. Why couldn't I get the detailing on the uh, university building, which is just across the street? Something that McKim understood that I don't understand. And it's nothing to do with words, rules, books, because there are a lot of books. Think of all the books on the parson laid end to end. The proper distinction of where the metaphors are and how the triglyphs are run. Uh, maybe one little trick is the thing that the Greeks knew and that we never even can see now. Up under where the uh, triglyphs, the part the well, there's a little part you, you can't see that just dips down and it's sort of cut into. Uh, and the full scale is only that much, 60 feet in the air. But in behind there, it's gouged out to make a shadow. Now that gouge in on the Parthenon is a, hyperbo is a parabola. It's cut back in in parabola. It is parabolic, not uh, uh, arcish, not like an arc, and not a straight line. And you can't tell from the street what in hell why is that good? You can if you have not I did have, I still could do that, 28, I pick up a piece on the ground. I wish I'd stolen it, but it, uh, <laughs> it, it showed that the, the way they made their shadows isn't with a cut. You and I would, we wouldn't think anything about it. Because no, and you can't tell the difference. But there's something in the way that a sun will hit something that is cut back parabolically that's different from, uh, from a straight line. It's those little things that aren't in the books. Yeah. Uh, you denied uh, truth to material, truth to the user, truth to function, truth to morality, but to you, you're truth to something. So what do I do with that? What do I? Pleasure. Pleasure. Well, that's what James calls it. Uh, to me, it's architecture. To me, uh, it's the greatness of the shapes and what the effect is on you. It's mostly the, the same thing as my bridge that wiggles. Uh, I'm making space now that we I haven't the foggiest notion what that building's going to look like inside. I made all the models. I can make those computer models more than anybody else. But it doesn't transport me into that room. So I sit there and look at them. I put my head in the model. I make them big enough. There's something about the scale of the room that isn't right. But it's going to be very funny to have the corner of the room go off that way at 20 feet high. Yet over here, I'm only nine feet high, and, and this wall behind me tips that way. Well, isn't that going to be 
Is it going to be good or bad? I don't know. I don't know. But uh, you see, it's not intellectual. It's not like a rim who's the intellectual genius of our time that is commenting, commenting, commenting with his uh, very, it's not a pretty house. You can tell that by just looking at it. But there's a man with total conviction and total ability to do things that you can't see. Another man is Frank Gehry. I went to his house uh, 15, 20 years ago uh, before I became known. It wasn't known at all. And I said, why is this little shack with a little covered with, with chain link fencing and torn down two bys? Why am I so attracted? What is this man doing? Uh, that, that gives me a visceral feeling. I, since you can't use a word like spirit anymore or any of these worn out terms, just gives you a good feeling in the stomach. But that's a good clue to me in my particular appreciation of architecture is if it makes me uncomfortable but pleasant, then I can't express it, because I usually can. I mean, that's what I'm in business for, especially him. Thank you, boy. Uh, but uh, if, you, if you can't express it, uh, why is it good? Over the years, I followed that house. He's spoiled it now, but uh, trying to fix it up for his wife. There you are. Uh, <laughs> functionalism reared its ugly head and, and spoiled the house. But, uh, <laughs> Well, that wasn't the subject, but, but I mean, that's a good, that's a very good example of not, not listening to your wife, not listening to, uh, to your client. <laughs> <laughs> Just go and have fun. But I, I don't know. I mean, why is Baron uh, a, a genius at, that, at those particular mountains around him? I don't know. See, I'm not quite sure I know what it looks like. I'm not sure he knows what it looks like. He should go out and build one, of course. He'd love to. Uh, isn't, isn't what happens, though, I mean, as much as architecture needs to deny it, it is systematically committed to the production of new, unexpected effects. Um, we were talking any, about in that. In any logic of the truth, any logic which would like to um, establish a, a kind of um, reliable way to approach the project essentially limits the capacity of the architecture to produce uh, and to satisfy an appetite for unexpected architectural experiences. It's, just, it's not that there's anything wrong with the truth or that it doesn't exist. It just makes it impossible for you to do what you have to do. Sure. Thank you. Here. Uh, there is a compulsion. Oh, yeah, that's recorded? Yeah, it is recorded because yeah. that's one of his <laughs> profound <laughs> things. No kidding. He, he pronounces these profound things all as if it was just anybody could do. He talks a lot. I use quantity. <laughs> quantity, not quality, and get you the same thing in the yeah. end. Say a lot, eventually you say something. Well, as, as Burke said, quantity, <laughs> quantity has its own quality. Quantity has a what is it? Quantity has a quality all its own. Is that it? You know who said that? And it wasn't Burke anyhow. Was Lenin. It? No, long before Lenin. Next it's English. Question. It was English. No, it was a question. Yeah. Your one chance to come talk to Philip Johnson, go up here to them. Then. Why should they talk? I want to talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's about the end anyhow, but uh, I, I, I will say. You covered the whole. Okay, you covered the whole. So no more? Adequate insurance. It's just national health care. I won't, I won't fall down. Uh, but I think that point of his is a good one, and what we have to do is to find out the thresholds of where we are, and I think the modern one in its old guise of, of Gropius uh, is worn out. It was, it was for Gropius, I mean, the last 20 years of his life was, was just junk. So uh, the best thing he did was before the First World War. Uh, I mean, he lived a little bit too long. But um, Nice, of course, was still going strong, but still it was running down. Still, the, the forms were getting repetitive. He did the Sigma building, but he did 10 others after that that are less, uh, less well known. Because, yeah. I sort of come back to you on this. I mean, okay, so uh, there's a different criteria. Uh, you and the criteria pragmatically, of course, it should be to build towards the new, but it seems to me that every time the new is good, it's co because it comes out of that, that's at least believing that the truth comes out. Oh yes, 
we believe we're making a statement. You mean? Yeah. Well, I'm absolutely convinced that I am. What, what do you mean? Uh, I mean, I don't agree with that. I, I think uh, we you you can demystify the work so much so that you no longer you know you no longer have to delude yourself into thinking that you're producing anything other than important or effects. And that the effects become an adequate dialogue and discourse in their own right. So I don't think it you, you put you find the architect essentially you're saying that the architect must delude himself or herself in order to pursue the transformation of his discipline. And I don't think that's true. Any more so than a filmmaker does. A filmmaker doesn't have to believe in a metaphysical or a political foundation for technique to, to transform the discipline through technique and make film continue to make film interesting. But and that's what you call the guilty thing. Well, I we're having a discussion on the topic that you read. <laughs> I mean, you can't say to me, here's my opinion, what's yours, and then when I give you my opinion, then say to me, isn't that just your opinion? <laughs> One more, okay. Do you have any um, inkling of what might become vivid after expression? Oh, no. Uh -huh. If I did, I'd do it. <laughs> we teach that in graduate design. <laughs> no, probably Rancuja. Did you all hear him last night? I missed it. Uh, but there's a man that's fully convinced that his road uh, is, is the right one, and I am not convinced. I want to go to Leo when he gets a little further along, and just see what's the effect on me. The effect on me with that house was exactly the opposite of what I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be dull and repetitive and pseudo Corbusier, say pseudo my place, no, nothing. Uh, but, you know, but he wasn't. This man has an uncanny sense for processionalism, for one thing. I mean, that's what you can't tell, the little picture of an ugly house. But when you go in, your experience as you develop the various aspects of the house start exciting you more and more and more. So he's doing something too smart for us to put words into right now. If you want a pure, straight guy, there's Ando. Very fine, very beautiful concrete. Everything's simply splendid. But uh, if you go to, uh, <laughs> if you go there, you will go there, uh, you feel that. Then you get the excitement of Zaha Hadid. But also you can't say, why? Can you say why that thing is, have you been there? No. <laughs> you people live in Europe and you haven't been. I have to come all the way from the States to get to get there. I can get there. Why don't you leave school? Just, they won't notice if you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> and bum your way or whatever you have to do. It's very near you can walk. <laughs> well, through the channel, maybe. Yeah. Begging, of course. Uh, because there is nothing like walking through that those experiences. It, it'll change your life forever. Uh, I really don't much care for Gary's uh, building. But when you get into that room, I defy you to find a more exciting room except in, in the very greatest of our churches because it just sets you off to such a thrill. Uh, but the outside is just a stuff put on the hall. So don't, don't take that seriously. Go there. It's the same with Zaha. Zaha has these pointed, cantilevered uh, uh, concrete, the way you saw it. And she also does a wonderful thing that I love. Uh, she pitches the floor uh, so slightly that you, well, do you know you're going up or do you think the house is going down? I forget which I ended up. But it's very disturbing. <laughs> Because there's nothing to mark it, you see. Yeah, it rises, doesn't it? And, and the, the parapets around it stay the same. So there's something to measure about the level. And then this goes up and gives you the, the nice, queasy feeling. Queasiness, I think that's the new, the new architecture. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Queasiness, there we go. Yeah, that's right. Every year a new is.